why things fall. In a nutshell, according to general relativity, there is no force that pulls things down. Instead, there must be a force to prevent them from falling. The moment all forces are removed, an object starts to fall. In the same fashion, you need a force to keep moving along a circle, but the moment the force is removed, the object starts to move straight. These situations are equivalent. The difference is that in one case we consider a motion through flat space, and in the other we consider a motion through curved spacetime. And so our topics for today include what is curved spacetime and how to visualize it, real life examples of curved spacetime, how objects move through curved space, why objects move through curved spacetime the way they do, that is, why things fall, and a summary. Let's start with the first one. Imagine that you have a magical wardrobe. It is magical because when you measure it from the outside, it is 2 meters wide, 2 meters deep, and 2 meters tall. However, if you measure it inside, it is 4 meters wide, 4 meters deep, and 4 meters tall. In order to investigate this magic, you make a cross 1 meter long and wide. You place two such crosses on the outside of the wardrobe and four such crosses on the inside. Then you draw a floor plan. You notice that the crosses inside the wardrobe are smaller than those outside. The magic of the wardrobe means that it can hold more stuff than expected, or in other words, that it compresses the space inside it. Your friend has a slightly cheaper model. His wardrobe is the same outside as yours, but only 4 meters by 3 meters by 4 meters inside, and so the corresponding crosses on his floor plan are squeezed horizontally more than vertically. These are the basic tools we need to investigate curved space. A local view tells you how space looks like from up close. For each local view, the nearby crosses are all the same size, because you can just walk up to them and measure them to be one meter long and wide. A faraway view, in this case the floor plan view, simultaneously shows areas where space is compressed differently, and so some crosses seem deformed. A cross on the faraway view represents so-called metric tensor. Metric tensor is a mathematical object which tells us how compressed the space is at each location. But that's not all. In addition to compressing space, the wardrobe also speeds up time. That is, you can synchronize two clocks, take one and go into the wardrobe, wait and walk out. As a result, the clock you took with you measured more time than the clock you left outside. So the actual metric tensor in general relativity shows how space is compressed in all three dimensions and how quickly time goes. However, for simplicity, we will ignore one dimension and display metric tensor as a cross and an hourglass. Smaller hourglass indicates slower time. Flat spacetime is when we can find a faraway view in which all metric tensors are the same and stay the same over time. Curved spacetime is when metric tensors change from place to place or from time to time. Our magical wardrobe is actually not a perfect example of curved spacetime because the metric tensor changes abruptly as we enter the wardrobe. In reality, changes in metric tensor are smooth. A real life example of curved spacetime is a neighborhood of a star or our planet Earth. Time has some default pace in deep space, but as you get closer to the surface, it slows down. This has been measured by atomic clocks put at different altitudes. Indeed, the clocks close to the surface tick more slowly. However, the difference is very small. For every billion seconds in the outer space, Earth's clocks fall behind by around one second. The space also has its default compression level, and as we approach the Earth's surface, it gets more and more compressed. Imagine eight spacecraft forming a square million by million kilometers, with the Earth in the middle. The distance measured from the sides of the square to the Earth's surface, plus the Earth's diameter, would be greater than a million kilometers, although the difference would be very small in the order of 20 centimeters. Alternatively, you could place the Earth at the center of a large cube. After filling the cube with uncompressible fluid, you would notice that its volume is a couple hundred cubic kilometers larger than it should be and so the Earth generates space around it, like the magical wardrobe generated space inside it. You might have seen a diagram representing curved spacetime as a surface with a hole and a planet hovering above it. 
These diagrams are essentially correct in the way they show how a massive object generates space around it. Note that the distance along the surface close to the star is larger than the corresponding distance far away. However, these diagrams do not show the flow of time. They may also be misleading if they suggest that gravity works by making objects move down the hill. As we'll learn soon enough, the gravitational attraction is mostly due to distortions of time rather than space. But first, let's discuss how things move through curved space. Take a small toy car. If you push the car gently across a flat surface, the car will go forward in a straight line. However, if there is a force pulling the car to one side, its path will be curved. Notice that when the car goes in a straight line, all its wheels travel the same distance. However, if the car turns, some wheels travel further than others. Now make a bump in front of the car. If you push the car gently across the bump, it turns. If you try to force the car straight across the bump, the wheels up the hill will have to travel further than the wheels down the hill. So long as you're pushing the car to go only forward, its trajectory tilts so that all wheels travel the same distance. Note that the same happens if you replace a bump with a cavity. This is a general rule of motion in physics. If there are no sideways forces on an object, it tries to go straight ahead and its path forms a curve called geodesic. If the space is flat, a geodesic is a straight line, but if the space is curved, a geodesic can also be curved. What characterizes a geodesic is that two connected objects moving on its opposite sides travel the same distance. Sometimes we cannot nicely visualize curved space and we only have a faraway view. But even then we can still figure out the shape of a geodesic. As the car passes the top of the hill, the actual distance per square on the faraway view is bigger for one wheel than for the other. If the wheels have the same actual speed, the wheel up the slope seems slower than the other wheel, which is why the car seems to turn. Now, let us put some crosses inside the cavity. This picture is similar to the faraway view of the space surrounding a celestial body. And so the reason why the car turns while moving through a cavity is precisely the same as a reason why a light beam, or any moving object, tilts its trajectory when it passes close to a star. This is not the whole story though. A real trajectory of a light beam passing a star is deflected much more than the space curvature would imply. We still have to explain why the light beam gets deflected so much and why objects that do not move at all are attracted. Let's do it! Imagine an elevator close to the Earth's surface held steady by two ropes. For simplicity, we assume that the Earth is flat. Remember that according to general relativity, there is no force that pulls things down. Instead, things fall because the space-time is curved. And so we will investigate three cases. Space-time around the Earth is flat, only space is curved, and only time is distorted. Let's track elevator's movement on a space-time diagram with height on the vertical axis and time on the horizontal axis. If the spacetime is flat, the metric tensor is everywhere the same. This picture has only one dimension of space, so instead of crosses, we should use vertical lines. Let's cut the ropes. If the elevator does not move, its top, its middle, and its bottom all travel the same distance through spacetime. Geodesics are straight lines in flat spacetime, and so the elevator stays in place. Now, let's say that only space is curved and it gets denser towards the Earth. Let's cut the ropes. After one second, all parts of the elevator travel the same distance through space-time, indicating that again, hovering in the elevator shaft is motion along a geodesic. This means that in our everyday experience we can ignore how the Earth curves space because its effects on the motion of objects around us are negligible. Curved space does not make things fall. Finally, let's say that the space is flat, but the time flows slower closer to the surface. After one second passes in the middle of the elevator, say 1.1 seconds pass at the top and only 0.9 seconds pass at the bottom. If the elevator keeps on hovering, the top part of it travels further in space-time than its bottom part, 
And so staying put is no longer a geodesic. We need forces to hold the elevator in place. What if there are no forces? Recall that the car on a curved surface was turning where the space was denser. Similarly, an elevator should go to a place where the time is denser. Then all parts of the elevator travel the same amount of time. So if time was like any other dimension of space, elevator would go up and gravity would be repulsive. The problem is that we measure the position of the top of the elevator first, then middle, then bottom. So we measure positions at different times. We may try to fix it by measuring all positions at the same time, but this is still incorrect. According to special relativity, events that are simultaneous for one observer are not simultaneous for other observers. So let's review special relativity. Consider a person in an elevator and three equally spaced sources of light. The sources emit light simultaneously and the light beams meet in the middle. We want the speed of light to be the same for all observers. So from the building's point of view, the light must be emitted from the bottom first, then from the middle, then from the top, in order to compensate for the fact that the elevator is moving. For a car, when calculating track lengths along geodesics, we take points that are next to the driver according to the driver, rather than coordinates we are using. For the same reason, for an elevator, we need to use points that happen simultaneously according to a person riding the elevator, rather than an arbitrary observer. So the true correction to our initial picture will be even bigger. It is now clear that the top travels much further in space-time than the bottom, and moving up is not a motion along a geodesic. On the other hand, if the elevator starts moving down, the time traveled by the bottom of the elevator is the same as the time traveled by its top, so the geodesic must tilt down. That is it. This is why things move towards the Earth when they fall. To sum up, when there are no forces, things simply try to move forward along a geodesic. If space is curved, geodesics may also be curved. Heavy objects curve space-time by slowing time and generating space around them. Curved space slightly changes trajectory of things that quickly pass by, but most of what we perceive as gravitational attraction is due to slowing time. In such distorted time, levitation requires force for the same reason why moving along an arc requires a force. Except that the direction of the force is flipped by special relativity. If there are no forces, objects fall. This may seem counterintuitive, but if you think about it, it does make sense. When you are free-falling in a gravitational field, you don't feel any forces, exactly like in the outer space. But when you sit on a chair, you feel that the chair is pushing up against your bottom, exactly as if you were sitting in an accelerating rocket. This is the famous Einstein's equivalence principle, an observation that led him to develop his theory. Copernicus and others came up with an idea that the Earth revolved around the Sun, even though it was obvious that the Sun revolved around the Earth. In the same way, Einstein came up with an idea that a falling object experiences no force, while people sitting on the ground have forces pushing them upwards, even though it was obvious that objects fall because of forces pulling them down. I hope it is not obvious to you anymore.